Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to go down memory lane a little bit and I'm going to talk about what it was like to be gigging and playing and touring back in the 90s, back when I was playing with my band grip. Now while I'm talking about this, I'm going to roll some pictures up of me back then and you guys can see what I used to look like. See a band photo of what the whole band looked like um, back then. And of course, yes, the band photo is taken at a cemetery because that was the thing to do back then. It's so overdone now, but that was like the thing to do back then in the 90s was get that pic. But um, basically, I just want to talk about it a little bit. It was really a great time in my life. It was pretty amazing. I was in my early 20s. I had moved back to Virginia where I'd gone to middle school and high school to start a band with my buddy Kevin. And he ended up being the singer and the bass player. And uh, it, was, it was really a crazy time. I mean, we had some crazy things happen. And it's definitely some rock and roll stuff to talk about. I'm not going to get into it all because I want to kind of keep this short. But it was a really interesting time because we pulled the band together. And within six months... Um, we ended up playing at this place called Tracks, which was like the place to go play. That was like, if you were a band, you wanted to be a band that played at Tracks. That was the thing back there in Charlottesville. Tracks doesn't exist any longer, it's gone. But back then, it was all about Tracks. Because they, the big bands, that's where they came and played. They played there. That's where we saw all kinds of bands play and stuff. And bands that we idolized played there. And then we eventually got to play on that stage and headline on the stage and actually be a band that actually was well known for playing there. So it was pretty awesome. but. Um, there's some things that went into that, you know, for us, we were diehard 100% serious about it. So we practiced four days a week. We practiced three to four hours a day. We'd usually be at band practice, start at 11, usually try to end around three or so. You know, so at least three hours a day we were practicing. We all worked nights. We all had restaurant jobs. So we would all work at night, get up, go to band practice, and then work again. And then on Friday and Saturday nights, that's when we would gig. We'd play shows wherever we had a gig at and stuff. But when you're first starting out, we used to play at fraternity parties, people's parties, anybody that was playing, just so you could get your name out there. And then as you start doing that, you start finally getting your first couple of shows at some of the little local smaller clubs and stuff. We also used to do open mic night at a place called Baja Bean there in Charlottesville. It was down near the university. And um, just to get your name out there. And you played anywhere you can. And you weren't, you didn't always get paid. I mean, as a matter of fact, you played more times for free than you, you played for money. But what ended up happening for us was a band called Private Property came along. And if I got a picture of theirs somewhere, I will throw it up here so you guys can see what those guys look like. Um, but um, they came along and uh, a friend of ours, Vince, actually knew them and had them come to a show that we were doing. And um, they liked us so much, they asked us to be their opening band for uh, their CD release party. They were releasing a new CD. And so we got to be their opening band for that. There was a ton of people there, like 1,500, 2,000 people. I can't remember what the, the number was. It was a lot. The place was packed. Whatever the capacity was, it was packed. And we did really well that they ended up liking us so much that we became really good friends with those guys and started doing shows with them. They got us to be able to play at the Iroquois and Roanoke, down in the Flood Zone. Um, we did shows at Jokers at, in Harrisonburg. And then there's a place in Greensboro we used to go to all the time. And I can't remember what it's called, but the guys from Of Dying Dreams actually got us hooked up with that gig. But there was like this um, circle of clubs that you would play in. So every weekend we were trying to play somewhere at least once or twice um, on the weekend. At least once a, a week we wanted to do a big show and gig. You know, sometimes we try to do two if it was possible. You try to book Friday and Saturday night, you know, and keep going. And that was the cycle of things, you know. So it was pretty crazy. It was a really crazy time. And for three years... I literally was playing guitar all the time. I had a guitar in my hands all the time. And, and I'm a, I do that now, but it was it was so awesome to have that experience to gig and tour. And I remember um, we, we had some friends that helped us. They worked for free. They actually worked for cigarettes and McDonald's is what they worked for. They they were our roadies. We had good friends of ours like Mark that would help out. And we, we they helped us lug gear and do all kinds of stuff. And when you're a new band starting out, your friends can be a huge asset to you when it's helping you out and doing stuff and trying to, to move forward. And they'll just, our buddies would help us out just because they want to go to the shows. And so they jump in. And our tour bus at the time, or our touring vehicles, I had a 1977 Volkswagen bus that had a sunroof on it. And that's where we packed all the gear. And then our other guitar player had a station wagon. So Kevin would usually ride with me in, in the, the Volkswagen. And then uh, the drummer and Cass would ride in the, in the other car with whatever girlfriends whoever had a girlfriend at the time was riding with us. And that's how we would travel and tour. Those were our touring rigs. Now, private property had their own tour bus. They, they did, took a school bus and converted it into a tour bus. So we got to ride on that a few times with them, which was really cool. But um, it was just a, it's very much a networking thing that we used to do. And, and, you know, I'm sure it's still networking today. I know it is, but I mean, 
when I see like the things that go on today for touring and setting up tours versus how we did it, it was it was all you, you're on the phone calling these places, you're doing promo packs. The way we used to record our albums was on a multi-track, a four-track multi-track recorder that was a cassette tape. I don't even know if you guys even know what cassette tapes are, but um, you took a blank cassette tape, you put it in there. We used to hang microphones all around the room, and we'd do a live recording, and we'd do a four-song demo, and that was our that was our tape. That was what we sold to people. You know, we would sit there and get a blank um, piece of paper, and we'd actually do the artwork on one of those, and then we would print off a bunch of them and cut it out for the inserts, and that would be the inserts, and we hand wrote all that stuff. You know, I ended up dating a girl for a while that actually had access to printing stuff, so she started typing up stuff and making stuff fancier. But a lot of the stuff was all hand done back in the day. Um, we didn't have all the technology you guys have to do things today, but it was a fun time, you know, and for those three years, things were good. We had an original drummer named Johnny. He ended up wanting to go do some other project with some guys that he went to high school with, so he left, and then we got um, Chris um, Wolford came in and, and was our drummer for the last year that we were playing, and inevitably, though, um, what ended up happening with us and my band was um, drinking and drugs um, kind of destroyed it, which is, is, you know, the cliche for... For bands is drinking and drugs come in but what ended up happening was is um chris great guy i love chris to death but chris started drinking a lot and we used to have to babysit him and then our guitar player this is a crazy thing our guitar player literally walked into band practice one day and he just tells us he goes hey guys he goes after band practice i'm gonna i'm gonna start trying hardcore drugs because i want to see really see what they're like and that's literally what we did like after band practice he ate a bunch of mushrooms and did some other stuff. I don't know what he did, but he was wiped out for four days. We didn't even see him for four days. I mean, he was just toast. And then it just became a thing. And eventually, uh, the bass player and I, Kevin, just ended up talking. Um, ironically, that was back when um, the record companies were coming around strong. So that's when Dave Matthews got signed and a bunch of other bands were getting picked up. And uh, um, we actually had been in talks with Atlantic Records back then with their A&R guy. But because we couldn't get it together with those two guys and it was a constant babysitting thing and the way record contracts work, and I'm not going to get into that, but it's crazy the way they work, um, we decided not to, to, to do a deal with them. Even though they said they could replace those guys and give us two new guys, um, in the end, we, we said no because we didn't want to be that in debt to a record company. And you're talking millions. If you don't, if you don't provide what you what you say you're gonna do and what they want then you can owe the record company millions of dollars and if you guys wonder like you see bands like even Guns N' Roses put out an album and it wasn't even Guns N' Roses it was just Slash I'm not Slash it was actually Rose with a bunch of other people but the reason why that happened is because record companies have requirements that you have to put out so many albums and stuff and even if the band breaks up you still owe them an album so there's a lot of there's a lot of legal stuff that goes into that, so there's a lot of things to think about when you're when you're doing that stuff. But in today's day and age, you don't need that anymore. You can put all your music out yourself. You don't need the record companies. There's a lot of bands that are doing that that aren't using the record companies and record labels anymore. So, but back then it was a whole different story. You know, all the bands we hung out together, we used to hang out at each other's um, band rooms, band practices, and I mean we used to loan each other gear when we had to if somebody needed something. It was, it was all about helping each other out. It was a pretty, pretty cool time. Um, and yeah, it was pretty, pretty, pretty great time for me. I do miss it. I miss the, I miss the band. Um, um, Kevin and I are still in touch. We're the only two that talk from the band anymore. We still don't talk. Um, you've probably seen him. He's been, I, I have pictures of him posted on, on things. Um, he's, I think he's in a couple clips on the channel because he's come up and visited a couple times and we've jammed out a few times. He came up for my wedding and it was really cool because for the wedding he came up and I was hanging out and I was, the, the drummer and the bass player that I play with, the bit, he plays guitar, the bass player plays guitar. So we all got together and on my wedding after everybody was in it, while everybody was still hanging out, we came into to the studio and jammed out for about, about an hour together and had a great time. So it was, it was a lot of fun. So anytime he comes up, we always get together and play. We play a lot of the old songs that we wrote. Um, I did talk to him recently, well, it was a little while back, but I did talk to him about um, I might um, take some of our old songs and redo them and, and um, re-release them and, I, and just to, to see if he was okay with that because him and I were pretty much the main writers of the, the, the music and he said, yeah, that would be cool. So I am going to be working on some of our older songs and, and releasing them in a new format um, to get them back out there. Um, I want him to come up and actually play on them and, and sing on them if he can. Um, we've actually talked about it, so that's something I do have in the works. So, but anyway, I just kind of want to talk about it. the '90s was a was a, a really wild time. 
I mean, the other thing that would happen is that, you know, everybody, when you'd go to play your show, everybody would come back to your house afterwards and it would be a big party all night. So um, it was just a different time back then. You know, I've never been a big drinker or anything like that and never been in the drug thing. So I was always the designated driver. That's pretty much how it landed for me. There's a few times where, you know, I mean, I, I do drink a little bit. I have a drink now and then, but I was never a big drinker, even back then. And I'm still not, I don't, I haven't, I, last time I had a drink was probably three years ago, two, three years ago. Um, I didn't even have any on my wedding. Cause it's just not, it's just, it's just not my thing. I mean, there's certain drinks I like, but I just, I just, I just don't do it. It's not my thing. But anyway, um, but it was a cool time, you know, and I wanted to share some of those pictures of um, what I used to look like, you know, back in the day. You know, we even, this one venue that we started playing at, we used to play on the ground. And I always hate playing on the ground. I hate being level with the crowd because too many things can go wrong. So we had actually talked to the owner and said, hey, we will build you a stage. And he's like, awesome. So my band, Rip, we took our money and we actually bought all the wood and we went in there and, and took a few days and we built a full blown stage in his club so we could have a stage to play on so other bands could have a stage to play on. And we donated that um, just so we could have that place because it was, it was Pete's Monticello Bar and Grill and that was in Charlottesville too. And Pete was a super nice guy. It's like a brewery now. But um, that was such an awesome place to play. The only thing that sucked about playing at Pete's place is that the area where you played where the stage area is, you had to go up these stairs because he had a restaurant and bar downstairs and he went up these stairs and he had a bar up there as well in this big open area that we could have the stage. And that was the only sucking part about that because you had to lug that gear all the way up them stairs. So you learn, like back in the day, everybody had a, a full stack or a half stack and had big crazy things. Once you started playing places like that, you started carrying around these 112s and stuff like that and just using that because it was a pain. Back then, I had a, I had a PV Rockmaster 400 watt head with a 412 cabinet. And I'd have to lug that thing up, and that thing was a tank. So it was, it was, it was a lot of work. But you know, I look back on those memories fondly because it was a really great time. And I've done, um, I've played in a few other bands, but nothing to that level. I mean, we were actually up and coming and doing really well, and playing on really big stages with really big bands. I've had the opportunity back then and back in the day to play with like a lot of the great '80s bands. I got to play with L.A. Guns and Fashion Pussycat and Rat, um, Molly Hatchet, um, open for Typo Negative, which was super awesome. That's another story in itself. Um, who else did we play with? Um, man, I can't remember off. Those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. Uh, but got to do a lot of cool stuff. We were opening for those bands, by the way, if you're wondering. We did like a 30 to 45 minute set, depending on what they wanted. Um, the Typo Negative gig was just totally by accident. So at, um, at tracks, they had a list of all the local bands and when um, touring bands would come in and want an opening act, they would call up, they would, they would say, well, this band will probably fit your music, and they would call that band up and see if they could come open for the band. Well, what happened with Typo Negative is they actually had an opening act, but the lead guitar player ended up getting sick, and so they needed some, a band to come fill in, and we were actually at band practice at the time, and we got a phone call, and they were like, hey, can you guys come down and open up for Typo Negative? And we were like, uh, yeah, so we stopped band practice, packed all our crap up, went down there, did a 45 minute set in, for opening for Typo Negative. Typo Negative is super cool, God rest Peter Steele, um, but he was super nice guy, super tall, holy cow that guy was tall. I was like a midget standing beside him. But they were all super cool, great band, amazing show, they were phenomenal. Um, I'm glad I not only got to open for them back in the day, but I got to actually see them live right there in person, hang out with them backstage. It was a great experience. A lot of fun, a lot of cool stuff back then. Um, there was a lot of bands that were super cool. There was a few that, you know, had that, you know, the lead singers had the um, um, LSD syndrome, which is lead singer disorder. Um, and they're, they're kind of jerks, but you can kind of put them in their place and, and move on with it. But um, yeah, it was a great time. It was a really great time. And, and, and I, I would do that all over again. It was a lot of fun times. Um, Kevin and I reminisce a lot about those times and we have a lot of great memories, made a lot of great friends um, and, and just really had a good time. So I will say this in the end, that if you do get the opportunity to go gig and tour with your band or a band um, and you're a musician, definitely do it. At least do it once. At least go do it once and see what it's like to tour and go from state to state and stuff. And we just toured up and down the East Coast. We never got to go out West really in any, but it was a lot of fun. And it was like little mini tours, you know, and stuff. Cause we'd go do, 
like we'd have like shows booked and we'd have a break in between you know and we'd go do like a friday saturday show have a break and then there because we played during the week too sometimes we'd have to take off during the week depending on um what was going on and, and play a tuesday show or a thursday show so we're constantly juggling our schedules with work but our, our job was really cool with it and so we were very lucky in that aspect because a lot of people aren't but excuse me but it was a great time the 90s were a lot of fun um the 80s through the mid 90s was a great time for music in general things really started changing and, and you know the later 90s and then into the 2000s and the music industry has gone in a big different direction um i could do a whole other video on that but yeah the 90s the 90s were a great time to be a band and be in your 20s playing and playing music and, and it's a great time there's a lot of great music stores that used to be in charlottesville there was charlottesville music there was stacy's music but stacy's music is still there they just moved to a different location um, and I can't remember the name of the other place that we used to go to, but um, Stefan, the bass player for uh, um, Dave Matthews, his father actually used to own it. So that was kind of kind of cool place to go to. So a lot of good times, um, a lot of good friends. Big shout outs to people like um, Rob that used to work at Charlottesville's Music and then went over to Stacy's Music. Rob is the guitar tech god in Charlottesville, and Rob has worked on probably every guitar I've ever owned. And he's a good friend of mine, and he's a great guy. And any of you guys that know Rob from Charlottesville, you guys know how awesome that guy is. And he's a great guitar player, by the way. So super great guy, really talented when it comes to working on guitars. And um, I learned a lot from him, and he still does stuff for me to this day. Um, um, granted, I'm a lot further away from him now than I used to be, but he's still a great guy. Because I don't live in Charlottesville anymore. I live hours away, but... Um, if I need something that I can't figure out because I've been doing all my own tech and stuff, then I call him. So, anyway, there you guys go. That's my rambling about the 90s. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the, the few pictures that I had from what I used to look like back in the day. And um, it was just a great time, you know. But anytime that you're playing music and you're on a stage and you got a crowd that likes what you're doing is a great time. I don't care if it's two people or 20,000 people. So if you're out there playing and doing your thing and, and, and enjoying playing music, then get out there and do it. I definitely recommend at least going on tour once in your life as a band because it's an experience that will leave memories for a lifetime. And there's so many stories. I just I didn't want to get into all the crazy, crazy stories that I could talk about about it and stuff. But anyway, that's what I got for you guys. I hope you enjoyed my little rambling rant of the 90s. And um, we will see you guys on the next video.